objective number three is the overall model useful? Now, again, to save time, I'll answer my own questions. Um, H0 is going to be the model. Model is not useful. We always express the H0 in the negative. Model not useful, meaning that all the x's drop out of the equation. None of the x's are, are valuable. And model is useful would be the H1. And we can say it three different ways. The first way we can say it is, like I said, remember we had it last time, beta 1 equals 0. But now we have a lot of betas, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4. In this case, let's take the example of two variables, beta 1 equals beta 2 equals 0. I just want to point out to you, if on the test or the homework, there turns out to be three x's, then you've got to do beta 3. For each x, they've got to be a corresponding beta. So beta 1 for x1, beta 2 for x2. What's the h1 going to be? Well, don't make the mistake that, don't write this down even, beta 2. That's for, of course, what's the opposite that they're all equal to zero? That at least one of them is not zero. This would be not true. So what the, way, the, way, the way to say down the H, the proper way of saying the H1 is that either beta one is not equal to zero, meaning that X1 really does help make a prediction, or X2 makes a prediction, or X3, or et cetera. You can simplify your life by simply putting down for the H1 H0 not true. But when H0 not true means that either B1 is not equal to 0, or B2 is not equal to 0, or both. Maybe they're both useful. But it turns out there's an easier way to express the H0 and the H1, and that's using something called, which we're up to right now, the coefficient to multiple determination. Now, anybody recall the coefficient of determination? Leave a space there, please, I'm going to put in the word, determination. Anybody recall the symbol for the, for the terminology? Yes, Marco? So, very good. so the R squared of chapter 13 was called the coefficient of, multiple of, of determination. And it represented what percentage of the, of, the, of the Y is being explained by the X. Now that we have chapter 14 of m many variables, it's going to be called the coefficient of multiple determination. And it means the same thing, multiple determination. And a symbol is going to be the capital R squared. That's capital R squared. Um, by the way, if you, if you never learned chapter 13, but you only know chapter 14, could you do chapter, can, can you do everything in chapter 13 by using chapter 14? And the answer, of course, is yes, because all you have is simply 1x. Beta 1, in other words, it boils, chapter 14 boils down to chapter 13 if you have just 1x. Now, if the x and y are totally unrelated, what would you expect the r squared to be? If all the x's are totally unrelated to the y, what would you expect the r squared to be? And the answer is zero. And if the and and if the if the x's are related to the y, either one of them, or two of them, or both of them, or all three of them, if there are three of them, what would you expect the r squared to be? No, if it's you know it depends on the sample size. The answer is bigger than zero, or not zero. So the two possibilities here: are r squared equals zero means that the x's are not related to the y, and the r squared bigger than zero would be the alternative hypothesis. It can't be it can't be not equal because you can't have a negative r squared. Okay, so now we have one of three ways of writing out the hypotheses. What's going to be step number two? Doing a calculation. And what's the calculation? In this case, it's going to be called an F calculation. And it's going to be the following formula, which again is different in the book. Um, the book has a whole different approach to uh, sums of squares, etc. But since the R squared is available to you on the printout, it's R squared divided by K, and we have to talk about what K stands for, and this whole thing divided by 1 minus R squared, which is the amount that's unexplained, divided by N minus K minus 1. So the only two variables that we haven't seen yet are the K. What's the K stand for? Anybody want to take a, take a lucky guess? What does K stand for? Yes? The number of independent variables. In this case, how many, what would be K in this example? This is probably one of the biggest mistakes on the test. What, what would K be in this particular example that's on the board that we've been talking about? Yes? Two. Now, a lot of people think K stands for the number of variables. Now, how many variables do we have in the problem? Three. Two X's and one Y. There's always one Y. So K stands for the number of independent, the number of X's, in this case, K will be two, and that's an important thing to keep, to write down and remember. What is, 
K stands for the number of X's or independent variables. And N, of course, stands for how many lines of data you have. You know, not the number of data, not the number of dot points, but I mean the number, of, if you graph this in three-dimensional space, will be points, but the number of lines of data will be the N. And after all is said and done, you get this number. But does the computer also print out the F number on the page of the print of the multiple regression? Yeah, you saw that to the ANOVA table. That's where the F comes in. So the, there is an F printed out for you. On the test, for some reason, which I don't really, maybe I can't justify this year because we're doing it a little differently, but anyway, just in case I do it again the same way, I white out the F. I expect, this is one of the only equations I expect you to calculate for chapter 14. The, you'll, you figure out the R squared over here, 0.52. You plug in a 0.52 there. So 0.52 divided by how much? Two, which is about 0.26, 26. And how much is one minus 52? 0.48 divided by, what's the end in this example? Well, we had the data in the previous slide, but I think there's 15. It said number of observations are 15. There are 15 observations in this previous, the camera can't see it, but there are 15. So it'll be 15 minus two. By the point, the point is, I'm not gonna do this right now, but you plug it into this equation, and you're going to get the same exact number as the F. You should come out to 6.53 in that case. All right, now, what's step number three gonna be? Always a diagram, which is, again, why it's amazing people, whatever. All right, so the diagram in this case will be an F diagram, not surprising, which starts out with a zero, the same as chapter 11, starts out with a zero. The alpha is on the right side, the reject region is on the right side also. The do not reject is here. You only have a one-tail test. You never chop the alpha in half, which makes it easy. Yep, you never chop the never chop the alpha in half for the F. Well, there, it turns out like there's never there's no rule. There's always a possibility, but for our class, you're never going to chop it in half. And finally, you got to be taught the degree of freedom, right? You know, in order to go to the F, you got to go. You have to, in fact, have two different degrees of freedom: how much across the top of the page you go, and how much down the side of the page you go. So let's turn. If you want to do it right now, um, let's take an example where we have um, alpha five percent. And the degree of freedom, which I should tell you, is going to be, this is the degree of freedom across, and this number over here is the degree of freedom down. So you go K, you go 2 across, and you go down 15 minus 2 minus 1, which is equal to 12. 12 down, and what do you see there? On the point oh five F table, for those who have a table and want to look it up just to make sure you're doing the right thing, when you go to the F table, point oh five page of the F table, 2 across and 12 down. <laughs> K is two. K is the number of X's. Hold on a second. No, the, 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 you go K across. You go you K across and the N minus K minus one down. Anybody have it up? Anybody have it yet? You go in K across, which is two, K across, which is two, and N minus K minus, it's built into the formula so you don't have to write, write it down separately. What do you get? Say again? 3.89, Sarah says, 3.89, anybody confirm that? Okay, so 3.89, and of course, in our case, since the F number came out to 6.5, I'll put it down for the people who don't have that, 6. Point, what do they say, 6.53? And 6.53 is to the right of that, the answer, first of all, is reject date zero. And of course, like always, for, an, for an, another a set of points to interpret that so the model is useful. If the question might say, is there evidence the model is useful? Yes, the model is useful. And we'll take, now, can any, for, the, for those of you who are going to be doing this on a spinner assignment, which you will be doing eventually, and that's the last spinner assignment of the whole term, what, how else would you answer this question besides doing it by hand? How else can you do it using this, the, the printout that's on the board? The answer, thank you, is the p-value. Now, it doesn't say the word p-value, but the significance of f is, if you might want to write this down, this is where the p-value is found. This 0, 1, 2 is a p-value. So the p-value is, the p-value is the significance, which in this case turned out to be 0 0.012. And since that is lower than the alpha of 5%, the implication is, again, to reject a zero. If, if the p-value is lower than the alpha, you reject a zero. So that's the easiest way to do it without having to go through all this other rigmarole. It doesn't, it's not called p-value here. It's called significance of the f, but it, this, is, this, this, is, this it means the same thing as the p-value. This, this is the printout. that You're going to be getting this whole printout. Maybe I'll, I might erase this number here. 
but um, but you can get that F number by, by doing this calculation.